Hello everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Bob Dickinson and I'm a product specialist who will be taking you through uh, the session today. We're going to be having a look at business process and progressive capture within Hornbill. Now um, there's going to be lots of information to take in so if you do have any questions the first place to have a look at, at the end of the session is the wiki which is wiki.hornbill.com. Um, we've got plenty of documentation around everything you're going to see today. If you can't get the answers you need please head towards our forums which are forums.hornbill.com and we've got a team of experts here who will be happy to help out with any questions or recommendations that you have, as well as the wider Hornbill community who uh, always chip in so you can see how other customers are using Hornbill uh, in this particular aspect. Okay, so business process and progressive capture, what are they? In its most simplistic terms, a progressive capture in Hornbill is what we call the series of questions that are asked when you're logging a request. Um, we ask them progressively, one after the other, to only ask and capture the information that is relevant to that particular request rather than bombarding a customer or a user or an analyst with a series of irrelevant questions or attributes that they might feel like they need to complete. It's very similar to booking a holiday online or to buying insurance online where it only asks you the information that is actually required. So to give you an example of this, if I go into um, the request list and if I was to raise a new service request, you can see it asks step by step for particular information. So first of all it's asking me for the customer, perhaps a summary and description of the request, and then you just keep working your way through and you can see we've got a service list and so on. priority at the end. And once you've completed, you might finish that and then that will log the request. So that's what progressive capture is. And there is plenty of features and functionality around that, which we'll be showing you later on today's session. Now, business process, on the other hand, is what happens to the request after it's been logged. So if I open up this change request, for example, we can see that there's a business process associated by the fact it's got a, what we call a heads up display along the top, this green bar. And this has different stages to the process. It has different checkpoints that can be completed within those stages. And it tells you exactly what's already been completed and what is still left to complete. So it gives you a visual guidance on where you are in the process there. But in the back end, this can be quite complex and you can have all sorts of automation. You can have tasks being fired off. Um, you can have emails, assignments various different things going on and that's what we're going to be covering as part of today's session is the creation of this business process and then linking it to a particular service. So to begin with what we need to do is we need to go into the admin tool. So I've got this on another tab you can access the admin tool from um, the user app simply by clicking on the menu and choosing administration I've got it on a tab up here and this takes me to the home page. Now to be able to create business processes and progressive captures you either need to have the admin role against your profile or the business process designer role. Um, that will give you full access to um, both business process and progressive capture, capture design. To access them both, you can either type it into the search box up here, but if you are navigating to it, it falls underneath service manager. And then you can see we've got the two options here for business process and progressive capture. Now I'm going to begin by creating my business process. So I'm going to click on this. And what you will get out on your instance, if you haven't designed any before, are a number of examples. Um, we've got plenty more on here because this is a demonstration kit. But if you can see here, we've got a few example ones. And these will be on your instance. So you will already have a few already set up, which you can use for reference. You can go in and amend them. Or you can take copies of them and then create. The, um, you can amend the copies. This list shows you all of the business processes you've got on your platform. Um, it gives you all the standard information such as created by, created on, created date. It also gives you a published version, which we'll be coming on to um, in a moment, and the current state of these particular workflows. Now, you also have some actions over here. So for example, we've got some information about the publishing, which again, I will come on to um, very shortly. If you want to copy a business process, you can actually use this button and it will just ask you for a name and it will create a copy of an existing process, which can be very useful if you are creating multiple ones which don't need to change too much, but you have some small amendments and you don't want to create them from scratch every time. 
If you want to rename your process, that's the next option along. And you've also got the ability to delete a process if it's no longer needed. And what I'm going to be doing is creating a brand new process. So I'm going to come up to the plus option, which is the create new in the top right. And I'm going to give this a name of webinar incident process. So once I've created this process, we're presented with what, what, what is called the canvas. Now the canvas is the white area here and within the canvas you have nodes. And as you can see, these nodes are drag and droppable. In between the node, the start and this end, which is the very basic uh, baseline that you get, we've got what was called a connector. And this is the arrows that describe the flow of your process. If you've used Vis Visio, you'll probably, or any type of process flow diagram, you'll probably be quite familiar with kind of the structure and the layout here. Now along the top, we have our stages of the process. If you remember, if I just navigate quickly back to the user app, the stages are the different components here, which signify where in your process you currently are. So the very first thing you want to do when building a process is think about what stages are needed for that particular process. Now I'm going to be creating an incident process today, and I'm going to keep this fairly straightforward and simple. So I'm just going to have three stages, um, I want to call them classification, investigation, and resolution. So to add some more stages, you've got the ability here to do that by clicking this plus sign. You can see that creates another new stage, and one more will create the final stage. And then to manage the stages themselves and to rename them, you've got the stage properties option here. So I'm going to click on this. And this allows me to not just rename the stage, But I can also rename that um, in different languages. So if you have um, multi-language support, if, you're, if you've got administrators who are going to be uh, accessing them from, this from their own language, you can actually put in the translation for that stage if you want to. And they will see that based on the language they've got set against their particular profile. The other very important part of business processes is checkpoints. So again, navigating back, these are the actual components within the stage or uh, that you might want your analysts um, to complete to get through to the next stage. We have two different types of checkpoints. You have optional checkpoints and mandatory. And you can tell the difference here by the ones that are in bold and the ones that aren't. A mandatory checkpoint is something that needs to be completed for you to carry on, whereas an optional one, as it kind of mentions in the title, is optional. It doesn't matter if it's been completed or not before you, um, it won't prevent you from moving to the next stage. So I'm going to create a few checkpoints here. I'm going to click on my add checkpoint. I'm going to create these as mandatory. And the first one is going to be um, email to customer. Let's call that email sent to customer, sorry. The next one is going to be incident owner assigned. Make that mandatory as well. And the final one is going to be instant prioritized. So I've got three things that I want to happen on every single instant. I want an email to be sent to my customer, I want an owner, and I want the instant to be prioritized before we move on to the next stage, which is the investigation. So fairly straightforward, fairly standard uh, functionality here. Now I'm going to also do the same thing for my uh, stages two and three. So this one I'm going to call investigation. And I'm going to put a checkpoint in here, a mandatory checkpoint of incident resolved, just one. And then my final stage, I'm going to be calling resolution and closure. Here, I'm going to have a checkpoint which is instant review complete. I'm going to make this one optional. You'll see why um, very shortly. And the final one is I'm going to have process complete. And I'm going to make that mandatory. So it's very important when you're building a business process to um, map out those stages and the checkpoints, the individual components that you want to definitely occur as part of this process. And how you want to visually make them appear in your business process by the wording. Now, one little thing you'll notice is that I was doing um, as I was creating these is putting everything in the past tense. Again, this is a preference. 
you can do it however you want, but um, one of the recommendations I have is if you do it in the past tense, it kind of signifies what has happened. When you've got the little tick by over here, when it's in um, past tense, you can kind of see the owner has been assigned, that's been ticked. If you have a mix match of te tenses, then it can get a little bit confusing about as to what has happened and what is to happen next. Okay, so now we've got the structure there, we can start creating the notes, which is where the actual process occurs. So the first thing I'm going to do is remove this component by um, simply clicking delete on my keyboard. I'm also going to remove this end node because um, the end node should be reserved for the final stage. So we do not need it in the first or second stages, so I'm going to delete that one. Now to create a new node, what you need to do is hover over any existing node that you've already got. I've only got one here now, which is start, and you will see these four arrows. Now if I hover my mouse over one of the arrows and click and drag, you can see that's how you create a connector, one of the um, black arrows that connects the nodes up. If I let go on any white space, you'll see we get a list of options. Now these are the nodes that we have available to us. I'm going to be covering a few of these today. Um, there are some that I won't have time to cover. So if you are interested in any of these, then do ask your product specialist. But again, these are all fully documented on the wiki and we have plenty of video examples as well on how you might want to use some of these. But the key ones that we're going to be looking at today are the automated tasks, the human tasks, the set stage checkpoints, and the next stage option. And at the end, we're also going to show you how a decision works. But the first thing I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be creating an automated task. Now, once you've created that, you can see an automated task is a rectangle blue node. Each of these types of nodes have a different shape and a different color to make it very visually obvious what's going on. And then when you've created that node, um, you need to look into the properties. So if you see here, we've got this cog. If you click that over on the right hand side, it gives you the node properties for this automated task. Now, an automated task is, as you might expect, something that is going to happen automatically without um, the analysts or without a user's involvement. It's been able to kick off things without um, any type of human interaction there. So the first thing I want to actually happen is I want to assign this request, any request that has this business process associated to it, I want to automatically assign it to a team. Now best practice is you should never, never have a request that is not assigned to a team. Um, if, a, if the request is coming via self-service, you might have a triage team of first-line support, if you um, are logging a request manually through the user app, you might choose to present the question of which team that request should be assigned to, to the analyst who's logging that. But you can do this via a business process, and you can do this via an automated task by automatically assigning it to a particular support team. So that's what I'm going to do here, and I'm going to call this one Assign to First Line Support. Now this title is really just the display on the node, so anyone who's looking at the business process in the back end here can see what's going on. Now, the process part for an automated task. The first thing you need to do is to select the scope. Now, 95% of all of the um, functions we have fall under entity. This application is a legacy option that we are going to be getting rid of eventually, but we've got a few bits we still use in there, so at the moment you do need to make a choice, but as, as I say, 95% 90, of everything you need will be under the entity scope. The entity itself is quite interesting, so again, you've got some different options here about um, which entity this automated task is referring to. And again, if you're beginning to build business processes, the majority of what you need will be under requests. We do have some specific functions for change requests, releases, connections and members, and boards, but if you choose requests, that's where the majority of the functionality sits, and it's certainly where everything today will be sitting. The next one is the type of automation. Now this should make a little bit more sense because these are the types of automated activity that we can cover. Now again, I'm not going to be able to show you all of these, but um, hopefully most of them are fairly self-explanatory about the type of automation that we can um, perform in Hornbill. For this one, we're assigning it, so this is an assignment type. And then you've got some further options about the type of assignment or the task. Um, You've got various options here, you can assign it to an individual, you can assign it based on a round robin basis, so one by one, you can actually pick the analyst, or even the most available analyst based on how many requests they've got currently got assigned to them. But for us we're just assigning it to an actual team, 
So I'm going to pick assign to team and then you just need to specify some of the details about which team that's assigned to. Now anywhere you see request ID, we can just leave that as auto. Anything that says request ID, please leave. It's not actually required for you to update. However, everything else you've got an option on. So for team, this is where we're going to put manual and we're going to pick the team that we want to assign this request to. So first line support. You can update the timeline of a, of a request. So just heading back to the user app, the timeline is shown down here. And if you want to have an update on your timeline, even for an automated task, you've got the ability to have a system generated one. Or if you want to put your own text in about what's happened, you can actually put that in there on the manual timeline update. So I'm going to choose yes for my system one. We're just going to keep whatever the system default is. And that's really it. That is our first node. As soon as we raise a request that has this business process assigned, it's going to start and it's going to assign the whole request to the first line support team. And everything else we're doing is really going to follow on from that. Now the next thing I want to do is to send an email to the customer. So I'm going to create a new node here, uh, another automated task. So this is going to be an automated email that goes out. Click the properties, I'm going to call this one send email to customer. And for this, I'm going to choose entity and requests again. But for this one, I'm going to choose a different type of automation, which is email notification. Now, under here, we've got some different tasks again in regards to the types of emails you can send out. Again, it doesn't have to be the customer. You can do it to the customer's manager, to an external address that you specify, um, or even to the owner of the, owner of the request. But for us, we want to email the customer. And you can see the options are different this time. The options actually change based on the type of automation. So the first thing we want to do is, um, again, ignore the request ID. But with the mailbox name, if you've got multiple mailboxes, you might want to choose which mailbox this is actually coming from. So I've got two, so I want to choose the service desk. And the next thing is the email template. So because this is an automated email, you will need to create a template that's going to um, be sent as part of this business process. Now to create an email template, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because this will be on a separate session. I'm just going to duplicate this tab and go back to the home page of my um, admin application. Click on system, click on email, and then we have templates. Now in Hornbill we give you a number of um, out of the box templates anyway, and you will have one which is called new request confirmation. So if we have a look at this one, what you can see in here is quite a basic template. Um, it's got some standard formatting. You've got loads of formatting options to be able to uh, make these look um, very good for your organization, to put your organization logo in, put images, links, all sorts. But you'll also notice we've got what we call variables. Now these are the components of the email that will change based on the content of the request it's coming from. So to add a variable, you can click on this variable section here and you get a list of all of the information that will be available from the request this email is coming from. So you can see here the customer first name and last name will change based on that request. So this is what we're going to be using as our email template to go out when a request has been locked. So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy this text and I'm going to pop back to my business process and paste in the name of the template there. And once again, I'm going to have a system timeline update to show me on the timeline that this, e this email has been sent. So once the email has been sent, what I actually now want to do is I want to mark my first checkpoint. So if you remember, we had one which was called email sent to customer. So I want to say that that's been completed. So I'm going to come to one more node here and we're going to have a set stage checkpoint here. I'm going to give this one a name of email sent to customer and then the set option gives me a list of the checkpoints I've already just des um, designed as part of the properties of the stage so this is basically the checkpoint you want to put the tick against so I'm going to put it against the email sent to customer so that's the first checkpoint done now the next node I'm going to add and if we actually go back actually to to the stage properties you can see I've got the instant owner has been assigned so what we want to do now is once the email has been sent is we want to wait until someone has actually picked up this particular incident. So I'm going to create another automated task.
and then I'm going to call this one wait for incident owner entity requests and I'm going to use a suspend node this time. Now a suspend node is automated because it automatically suspends the whole request to wait for something and that request will not move on until it's actually received the area that it's, at, that it's requiring. So for example you can have suspend wait for a closure code, you can have suspend wait for an external reference, suspend wait for a resolution. Um, until you've got or until you've provided that, it's not going to be able to move on. You won't be able to progress your business process. So it's a good way of holding things up to ensure that you've got the information that you require. So from this one, we're actually going to have wait for request owner. Now, you, when you have any suspend node, you also have this action focus option. And this will signify which of the action tabs you actually want to highlight. Um, I'll, this will make a little bit more sense when I give you a demonstration but you can actually see the different action tabs that you have on a request and it makes sure that it focuses on the area that needs to be completed next. So I'm going to choose for this one a site. Okay, let me just create that spender mistake. Now once the owner has been provided, we want to move on. So we're going to mark the checkpoint to say that an owner has been provided. So I'm just going to create one more node here, another set stage checkpoint. You can see we've created one of these before. And I'm going to call this one owner assigned and then pick the second option in my checkpoint list there. Now the final thing we're going to do is we're going to actually have a, another suspend node which is wait for priority. So it's exactly the same concept but we're just waiting for a different component of the request to make sure the request has been prioritized. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I want two more nodes in which are very similar, which are our, our suspend wait for priority to ensure the request has got a priority before moving on. So the same concept as the wait for instant owners, but this time I'm going to select these nodes. Um, if you want to select multiple nodes, click and hold control on your keyboard and select them. And you can tell because there's a, sh a dark outline in the background. I'm going to right click and click copy these selected nodes and then I'm going to paste them into the same workflow. So if I now drag these, we all need to rename them, but I can actually just link up the nodes by hovering over the existing one, dragging it and moving it across the new node, and you can see that connects them without asking for asking to create a new node altogether. Now, once you've connected those up, I'm just going to pop into the properties here and rename these. So I'm going to call this one wait for instant priority. And instead of suspend wait for instant owner, I'm going to choose the wait for request priority there. And I'm also going to stick this, the action focus on prioritize. And then the checkpoint for this one is obviously going to be priority assigned, and we're going to choose the instant prioritized checkpoint set. So that's all of our checkpoints have now been set. You can also see um, it gives you a little warning when there's a problem and if you hover over this it actually tells you what the problem is there. So you can see it says the node has a bad or missing exit connector. So what we need finally is one more type of node which is our next stage. So I'm just going to drag some white space, choose the next stage option which is kind of this turquoise uh, shape. Now with the next stage if you leave it empty it will just move on to whatever is the next um, consecutive stage but you can skip stages so for example in a change process if you had a let's say emergency change you might choose to skip a stage if you made a decision for that particular type of change so you can actually say go to and then move over to another stage you cannot go back on state in stages in business process so that's something to bear in mind when you're designing your workflow so that's the first stage complete. Now I'm going to save this, and what you'll notice is when I actually save it, it still shows the process in draft up there. And what we actually need to do is not just save a process, but you also need to publish it. So you can actually see um, this publishing manager, and this is how we version business process in Hornbill. So you can see the different versions, and you can go back to a previous version if you need to without taking continuous copies. So um, I'm going to keep it in draft for the time being, but when I'm ready to publish it, I'm going to click this publish button and that basically makes it active and ready to be used. 
So we'll come back to that in a moment, but just to save your draft, it's the Save button here. So the next stage is kind of a continuation here of the previous stage. So I'm just going to um, perform some very similar functionality for this one. I'm just going to delete the connector. I'm just going to actually paste. I've still got these copied. So paste the previous nodes because they're the same type of things that we want. Drag this around. You'll see that I use the canvas quite a lot to uh, just make sure and um, to try and get my lines neat and tidy as well. If you are looking to get your lines neat and tidy, um, you can see you can actually use the shift button. If you highlight a node and click shift, you can actually use up and down to uh, get it almost spot on in terms of the actual alignment. But in this scenario, I just want to um, actually wait for the request resolution. That's all we're waiting for here. So I'm just going to put wait for instant resolution. And this one here, we're going to wait for the resolution. Because an instant can be so generic, it literally could, anything could be happening. So all we're waiting for in the investigation is once it's complete, to wait for the request to be resolved. And the action focus here. I'm actually going to put the action to focus on update because I don't want it to be on resolution because if people are working and putting updates on the request, resolution and update can look quite similar and you might get someone accidentally resolving the call when they went to put an update in. So just a little tip there, even when you're in the resolution or the investigation stage, just have the focus on update. And then for my owner assigned here, I'm just going to put something like incident resolved as my checkpoint. So just reusing the nodes, and then this one, reset the instant resolved. Again, I don't need the end node here, so I'm just going to delete this node. So I'm just going to actually use my next stage node, which we're going to use um, to move on to the next stage. And the final stage here is going to be resolution and closure. Let's just connect those up. There we are. So save that one more time. And then the final stage here, the resolution and closure. We will be keeping the end node this time. I'm just going to move it out of the way slightly. And I'm going to show you a couple of different nodes here. So first of all, we're going to create another automated task here. Now this one here is a slightly different type of one. And this is what we call a get request information. So I'm, what I'm, the reason I'm going to get this I'm, is because what I'm looking for is the priority. So I'm going to call it get request priority. Now what a get request information node does, if we go to entity and requests, it takes a snapshot of the request at that current point in time. So it gets all of the information that's been recorded from that request and then you can use it for a decision purpose. Now you do need to take a snapshot at the point at which you want to make the decision. The reason you don't do it at the start is because um, information could have changed since the start and since you got to this point. If the priority has changed, you don't want to know what the priority was at the start, you only want to know what it is at this point when it reaches this particular stage. So it says get request information or get, get request details. Now you can get other information for, um, which is related to the request, for example customer organisation and questions, but we want to get the priority and that's contained within the request details. Now the reason we want to do this is because we're going to actually make a decision next. And this is a different type of node, so it's called decision, and you get this yellow diamond. And you can see the difference here is that this node has got some different outputs. It's not just a one-in, one-out style node. Now what we're going to do is we're going to create two different outputs here. I'm going to have one which comes down here, and I'm going to create a human task, which we'll come back to in a moment. And I'm going to create one over here, which creates an automated task, which again, I'll come back to in a short moment. So the next part is actually choosing the criteria to decide which path it should go down in, your, in my business process. So in between these um, nodes and the decision nodes, you've got the criteria on the connector. So if I actually select one of these, you can see you've got the outcome of the decision that you've made. So what I actually want to do, first of all, I'm going to set this to no match, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But this one here, what we can do is we can actually put a display name. So I'm going to just call this one high priority. And all this does, just like the display name anywhere else, is that it will put the text there for anyone who's looking. And then you can add a custom expression. So from the custom expression, what we can do is we can actually use the, what we captured in the last node, which is that snapshot. So if I have a look at our flow code here, you've got the get request priority node that I set up, and you've got all the information that's been captured 
as part of that snapshot. So I'm going to choose the um, priority and click on override. And then you put in what the priority should match for it to go down in this uh, direction. So for us, it's if the priority equals high, we want it to go this way. Now what no match means is kind of the catch-all for everything else. So you could have different decisions that are going out based on if the priority is high, if the priority is medium, and the priority is low. But in our scenario, we actually have if it's medium or low, we don't it, it, either way it, it should go this way, it should go on this particular path. Only if it's high should it go down to my human task. So that's when we use the no match option. So it's always going to go this way if it's not high priority. So that's how you use user decision mode. Um, typically, they do have a get request information before them, but then you can have different paths. And if you have more than three outcomes, you can actually chain up decision nodes using the no match option, one after the other. So you can have as many decision nodes um, and as many outputs as you need. So just to cover the next option here, which is the human task. Now, a human task is a, an activity that can be assigned and generated automatically from the business process and assigned to um, a user, a particular team, so everyone in that team has access to, that, to, to complete that activity, or to a role, which you can then assign to users. So a nice example of where a human task could be used is if you had a new starter process. When it got to the fulfillment stage, you might have various activities that go out one to whoever needs to set up the Active Directory, one who needs to order the equipment, and one who needs to set up the workstation. All the tasks are from the same request, so you don't need three separate requests for that, but they're all as their own entities, so they can all be assigned individually. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a human task assigned here. I'm going to call this one High Priority Incident Review. I'm just going to copy that text into the title and then we can um, give it a category as well of just task. Now the owner and the assigned to, these are the people who would actually be assigned the task. So you may choose to um, have it to an individual, a group role, a role or a group, as I've already mentioned, or you can actually use a variable. So that's picking someone from the request itself. So for example, if I have a look at our flow codes here, We've still got the get request priority option. I'm going to go for the owner. We've got this owner for tasks specifically. So whoever the, is the owner of this request will be assigned this task. You can put in some lifespan settings, some expiry dates, some due dates, bits and pieces like that. And you will need to provide some task details. So I'm going to um, put here something like perform a high priority review once complete, add your comments and complete the task. So it's fairly standard. You can add checklists as well if you want. Um, and you can actually specify different outcomes. And you can make a decision if you wanted on those outcomes of the task, which again, lots of our customers do. So I'm just, for me, I'm just going to have one outcome, which is going to be called review complete. I'm going to ask here for someone to put in some comments when they're completing this review. And then for the label, I'm just going to call it review complete. And you can change the colors as well based on whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. So that's my um, human task that's been created now. And I'm just going to create one more checkpoint here, which was my step, set stage checkpoint and we're going to have the instant review complete. So that's why I made this one optional, because if it's not high priority, it's never going to go down this route, and that particular checkpoint is never going to be marked. So this is a, an optional checkpoint to only be marked if it's high priority. Now this node up here, if it was no match, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a final automated task, and I'm going to call this one set status to close, and let's choose entity and requests and we've got the update request option here and you can this is where you can update various components of a request and I'm going to update the status so again here on the status we can choose closed I'm going to put in a timeline entry as well and then that status is going to automatically set the request 
that will set the request states to closed. And what we can do, we can actually loop back up, so you can see that will set to close after the instant review has been complete, and then the end node will add in the final process complete part at the end. So let me just uh, remove this connector, and I'm just going to drag a final checkpoint here, which is our set state checkpoint for the process complete. So we just call this one process complete. And then set the process complete down. Okay, so that is now our draft process completed. Um, it's not too much to, to it, but you can see how simple it is to create. Um, once you're finished, you will need to publish this to make it live. So what I'm going to do is on our publisher manager here, click on publish. Now you can see that is now my live version, which is version one, and it gives you a little audit. If I was to make a small change to this, even if it's just moving the node, let's choose this end node and move it down slightly, let's say to there, you can see that if I save the draft again, you will need to publish the current draft. So if I click publish once more, that then puts it as the second version, and I can still view the previous version if I need to, and I could even activate the previous version, but this shows you the current version that is currently live. So we're going to test this in a moment, but before I do, I want to also show you progressive capture and how you might set up a quick one there, and then we can put it all together in one demonstration. So I'm going to go back to Service Manager and on Progressive Capture, and you can see the, the setup of Progressive Capture and the visual side of things looks very similar, but they are two different functions, so it's important to keep that in mind when you're building these. Now I'm going to actually just choose our an existing process here. We've got one called New Incident, which is the default that's used for any instance that are created via the user app, so you want your analysts to log in, and that's the one I'm going to give you an example of today. So you can actually see here, the main difference between the progressive capture and the business process is that a progressive capture doesn't have stages. It's just one set of questions. Now you can have questions going off in different paths, on different paths, um, based on the answers to previous questions, but it's all done on one particular progressive capture. Now, Again, one of the other things that's important to realise is you can have multiple progressive captures for different services and catalogue items. I'm not going to get into that. That's for the services webinar and also something to discuss with your product specialist. However, we're going to keep things simple today and we're just going to edit the existing incident progressive capture. Now, these blue nodes, they're a little bit like automated tasks, but these are what we call forms and we have out-of-the-box forms that we provide you, so you can kind of see some of the defaults we've got there, which include um, contact search, customer search, selecting a site, selecting assets, all sorts. Um, so I'm going to keep these as they are. Um, we can make them mandatory, so your customers or your analysts do need to actually populate them. So I'm going to make some of these mandatory. Let's have the request details mandatory as well. The service needs to be in every progressive capture, and that should be mandatory. And then the priority, again, you might choose to have it in a progressive capture of the user app, but potentially not on your portal. But I'm going to make it mandatory as well. I've got the same kind of drag and drop functionality as previously, but what I'm going to show you here is just a couple of other types of forms you can use. Same way of creating a new one, drag it to some white space. I'm going to have a branch to start with. The branch looks very similar to the decision node that you might be already familiar with like in the business process. And then we're going to have disconnected to the end, and I'm also going to have what's called a custom form here, which is a purple rectangle, and I'm going to connect that to the end as well. Now, for my decision, I'm going to do the same kind of decision as I did in the business process during the login of the request, and that is if it's a high priority, I want to ask them another couple of questions but I want to define, to define the questions I ask. They aren't, they aren't out of the box ones. So it's just as we did previously, you click on the decision node. I'm going to call this one high priority once again. Click a custom expression option. And you can see here we've got all of the all the questions and all the information that's already been captured as part of this particular progressive capture. So I'm going to look for the priority, and if the priority name is equal to, we've got different operators there. But if it equals high, it's going to go down this way to my customized form. Otherwise, it's going to end the progressive capture there. Now, on the, on the customized form, if we open up the properties to this, this is 
um, a whole new page which will open and you can have multiple questions on this form. So the first thing you need to do is provide an ID. So I'm just going to call this high priority. Keep it all one word because you may need to reference this in the future in your business process. The prompt is a form prompt. So um, it's kind of asking the customer. Um, so this is a description of what this form is asking you for. So I might have something like, uh, please complete the high priority related questions. And then you, the form fields is basically the questions that you have on this form. So I'm going to add, have two here. I'm going to click the first one, click on add field. You can keep the field ID the default, but the label is really the question name. So this is how many users is this affecting? You can put a short description there as well. Let's have something like select from the drop down. Um, you can make it mandatory, which I will, with this option here. And then you've got different types of question you can have. So you can have a single line text field, you can have, ask them to put in a description with a multi line paragraph. You've got check boxes, drop down lists, date pickers, all sorts there. Um, for my one, I'm going to have a um, static drop down list, which is this one here. And when you have this, you can then add in the items you want to appear in that drop down. So I'm just going to have. Uh, let's go for just one user. Now this, what we're doing here, we're putting it twice because you've got the display and the value that's stored in the database. But if you want to keep them the same, that's not a problem. So the second one is going to be 2 to 10 users. And then my third one will be 11 plus users. So three little options they can pick from. Click apply, and that's my first question. I'm also going to have an extra question here, which is going to be, please describe why this is high priority. Just to show you how two questions look. And on this one, I'm going to just have a multi-line text field so they can put in um, kind of lines of text, free text. And that's it for this one. So you can kind of see here that if it's high priority, it's going to go to the custom form. If it's not, it's going to go to the end. Slightly different save method with progressive capture. Um, you've got the save option, but you don't have the version in at the moment. So what we ask you to do is click this little arrow here, and when you're ready to make it active, click the activate button, which is quite important because if it's in use and you just click save, it will actually turn it off. So ensure that when you um, have saved any changes, you make sure you activate it. And you can tell it's active by going back to the progressive capture screen and simply check in the new instant option and making sure it's turned on. If it's off, you can simply click it and it turns it on and off using the toggle option you've got here. Okay, so now we've built our progressive capture and we've built a business process, I'm gonna give you a demonstration of how they work. So to do this, we just head back to the user app. Now, the progressive capture and business process are linked via a service. So Hornbill is service driven, so when you um, create a request, you will need to select a service, and that service will have a business process, or it should have a business process associated to it, and that is how the connection is made between your request and your business process. It's kind of the service is the glue that combines the two. So the first thing I want to do is actually go into my service catalog. And don't worry if you've not seen this yet, there is a webinar which is dedicated to this. Um, you can create a new service. I'm going to pick an existing one that I've already made, which is just going to be called IT Support. And from within here, you've got the options to click on the request config and the different types of requests that can be raised against this particular service. And this is where you would select the workflow, i.e. the business process that's used if an incident is raised against IT Support. So once you've activated your process, you can see your whole list of all your business processes here. And if I have a scroll down, hopefully right at the bottom there, there's my webinar instant process. So that has now linked the two together. The progressive capture is slightly different. When you raise a request in Hornville, if we go to the request list, you see you've got these options here. Um, you've got the ability to click this arrow and choose instant service request problem, no error, change or release. Each one of these has a default progressive capture behind it. And then you've got the raise new button, which also has a default progressive capture 
um, which is slightly different. That's what you would use if you didn't know the type of the request before you logged it. The one that I've edited is the incident default. And these defaults are set in the system settings in the administration tool for this particular um, user app configuration. So I'm going to click on new incident and that should kick in with my newly amended progressive capture. Now immediately I can tell that this has actually kicked with the changes that I made because if you can see closely this has a red border around it which means that this search customer option the first question that's asked is mandatory. So if I try and click next it says this is a required field. Now if you can remember I actually changed that from non-mandatory to mandatory so we know that my changes have now been applied. So I'm going to click Steve or type in Steve, click on next and you can see this is the progressive way that you log the requests. A mandatory summary and description. So let's put my laptop is broken and screen won't turn on. Now the next part is very important that's selecting the service. So there's my IT support service that I've linked to my business process to. So for the example I'm going to select this one click on next. The priority We've got the priorities here and I'm going to, for example, I'm going to choose the high and click on next. And what I should hopefully see now is my new form. So this is the custom form that I created, uh, the purple one. If we just go back, this one here, because it's gone down this path. There's my drop down list, so I'm going to say two to ten users. Um, and for the please describe why it's a high priority. You can put in as much text as you want here. I'm just going to put multiple customers affected. And then you get the finish button to complete it. Now you wouldn't have been asked that had this been anything other than the high priority. So once you've clicked log, that has now logged our incident. You can see the reference at the top. You can go back to the request list or you can click view to have a look at this immediately. And what we can see is because it's logged the request against the IT support service, it has actually associated my new business process. So along the top here, you've got the three stages that I defined, classification, investigation, resolution, and closure. If we actually open up the business process, you can see what's already happened. Hopefully, this has already been assigned to first line support. It sent the email to the customer and it's marked the checkpoint. So let's have a look. There we are, it's assigned to first line support. It's marked the checkpoint, and that means hopefully in my timeline you can see all the automated actions that have already happened. There we are, you can see an email has actually been sent to Steve. If I wanted to see that email, a little tip for you, click on more actions and view email, and that will show me exactly what has actually been sent out there. And you can see the variables have changed based on the actual request. So let me just go back to the instant there. Now, you can see the next thing that I want, I'm waiting for my business process for this to move on is for the instant owner to be assigned. And if you remember earlier, I was talking about the action focus. What that means is these action buttons um, are where you can actually move on a request to perform the different um, actions you need to do. And I've focused it on the assign option. So it shows me I just need to assign it to someone. I'm logged in as Graham, so I'm going to assign it as myself. To be, so I become the owner. And you can see here, but Graham's now the owner. What you'll also notice is that it already marked the instant prioritized. Even though we put a suspend, it didn't need to suspend because we had already asked for the priority high as part of the progressive capture. So it's moved on and it's moved me to the next stage. The green bar has signified where I am. And I know now I can perform my investigations. I might go back and forwards with the customer a bit. I might put in some updates into the timeline. But once I've done my investigation, once I'm happy for this to now be resolved, um, and move this on. If I click the resolve button, you can see that um, it's asked for a resolution. I can say, um, let's just put rebooted the laptop working now. If I click resolve, that has now marked the investiga investigation stage as complete. It's moved me on to the final stage. And if we have a look at that business process, you can see because it's high priority, it should have generated the task and assigned it to me as the owner. Now you can see your tasks on the right hand side of the request as well as multiple, multiple other places in Hornbill. 
But if you're in the request and you're looking at your task, you can see there's the one that I've generated. It's been assigned to Graham because he's the owner. If we open this up, it's got the description and the title that I put in. And then if we go to complete this, you can see um, I can put in my reason. Let's just put review complete. You can put in anything here. You can put in some time spent on a task as well if you want to put in how long it took for, for this particular review and then report on that in the future. Um, and then you've got the option here to put the green button that I create, which is just review complete. And hopefully, when I complete this, you can see that it's marked it as complete, marked my checkpoint. It's marked the process complete checkpoint. Hopefully, that, that, there we are, the status is set to close automatically and the final end node has marked the process as fully complete as well. All of this has been recorded in the timeline. This has all been generated from the back of my business process that I built in the back end there. And you can do so many other options with a business process. Um, we've li really scratched the surface there. So my advice to anyone watching this webinar is to go ahead, build your own basic progressive capture and business process there, and start seeing what else is available to you. We've not covered SLAs, we've not covered kind of parallel tasks. We've got a huge number of fantastic integrations, which you might want to uh, have a quick look at. All of this is available in the business process, but, but start small and build your way up. That's the best way of doing it. And also one other final piece of advice, I would always advise to map out your business process on a scrap of paper before you build it, even if it's just with the high level stages and checkpoints. It really will help you be more efficient with the build and it will reduce the number of mistakes that you need to make because it's already kind of mapped out for you and you just need to put it into order. So I hope that's been useful. Um, there's usually quite a few questions off the back of this. Your product specialist, if you are part of a switch on, will be building your business process with you. So they will build a business process based on your requirements to make it map to your particular uh, business needs. But do please have a go yourselves and uh, hopefully you'll be enabled to build your own ones in the future. Once again, thanks for attending and I hope to speak to you all again shortly. Thank you and goodbye.